Well, we got some credence happening here, bringing us in. Okay, everybody. We are. Hi. I haven't had a haircut in a few weeks, you know. Hopefully, we'll figure something out for this. So, uh, gosh, wonderful to see you all out there. Um, sort of great. Um, because of last week and the um, bit of a confusion on, on, in terms of muting. So I'm having everyone, just as you come in, you're muted. And we'll see how that goes. Um, it was great getting all of your response from last week and uh, the conversation at the end and then, you know, just being able to share it all with you. So uh, we're here again, one week past last week. Last week we were looking at Cezanne, this week we're going to look at Giacometti and um, feels like Last week feels like a year ago, given everything that's going on. Um, I hope you're all well and uh, staying calm, hanging in, eating well. Uh, some people I know are doing Zoom, Zoom conferences with their friends and having happy hour. So, you know, you can share your wine or what have you. Anyway. Okay. So uh, I wanted to talk about Giacometti this week, and um, when I first thought of talking about Giacometti, um, I thought of um, a BBC documentary that I had seen some years ago, where he's he's sculpting the whole time. He's talking. It's, it's black and white from the 60s, right? And he's, he's sculpting and doing, you know, like this the whole time as he's talking into the camera. And they ask him, why are you uh, sculpting while you're talking this whole time? And he says, it keeps the fear away. So I mentioned this uh, to a friend when I was talking about putting together, you know, like a, some webinar for Giacometti. And then when she saw the title, that the title is uh, In Search of Presence, she said, what happened to uh, keeping the fear away? So we'll look at that and we'll come back to it. And what is the relationship of searching for presence to keeping the fear away? Okay. Um, right. So I want to talk a little bit, just give you, I don't know how many of you are all, uh, familiar with Giacometti. Alberto Giacometti was a, a Swiss sculptor and painter, um, through the first half of the 20th century. He, I think he passed away, died in 1966. If I got that right. Uh, he was born, I think 1901. Um, he came from a family of artists in Switzerland and as a young man he learned to paint. Uh, he did these kind of post-impressionist paintings and his uh, early sculptural work, he was involved with the uh, Surrealists in Paris. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a, sh a screen share and this is all, by the way, this is all recorded. So uh, afterwards, uh, I'll be able to uh, upload it and anyone who missed it or wants to see it again, you'll be able to get there. So um, I'll do a screen share right now. And, and when I come back, probably I'll do a larger screen of just me uh, talking. Um, let's see. So screen share. Okay. And we're going to go to here. Okay. So the this is, that's my girl, Gabby back there. We got my girls in the studio right now, um, hanging out. Okay, so uh, this is, I believe it's called Three Figures and um, an early surrealist sculpture by Giacometti. And let's see if I can lower this and get to the next one. This is called Surrealist Table. 
so all, all you can see this work is you know taking uh, uh, surrealist ideas, psychoanalytic ideas, uh, you know, playing them out in a way that's very different than the kind of a classical, uh, you know, long uh, people or the, the the paintings that we know. Uh, this is in the, I believe, the late 30s. He starts going back to working from observation and he's painting. And um, let me close in on this. This is, so you can see he's looking at an apple on a table, something very, very simple. He's trying to like pare it down and take a look at it. He's throwing down tonality and kind of like doing these little marks or scratches. Some of them are, are, are paint marks, some of them are little scratches as he's uh, sort of exploring what he's looking at. Here, here's one here where he's like, you can see he's trying to figure out the tabletop. Here's another one. This is not a detail, this is a- Hey Jordan. Yeah. Um, all we're seeing are thumbnails. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. How about now? Yes. Thank you. Okay. You, you got Here we it. go. Oh, let me go back. So I this was this is composition with three people, I think, something like that. This is surrealist table. Here's a still life with an apple. Are you doing that? Yeah. And oh, you can FaceTime the voice now. Um, Please mute. Until... Can you guys mute? Thank I you. 30. Hello. It's so hard to dinner then, but okay. I 30? Please. If it's in your household, it's nothing to do but eat. So here you can see uh, he's trying to explore the tabletop. In this one as well, we've got these marks that are, uh, some of them are scratches, some of them are thin uh, paint marks. And things that are like this, that are look like they're just, a, just straight down on the canvas, he's actually trying to come to terms with the uh, plane of the table. He's trying to, so he's, he's marking as a sculptor. He's putting paint down, but then he's exploring it like a sculptor would explain would explore uh, planar structure, mass, this sort of thing. So here's a, a painting of his brother Alfredo, Diego, excuse me. Al, he's Alberto. This is Diego. And we can see the way he's he's using his marking as a way of exploring the like the cross contour like the feel of the sleeve and the jacket and his right and even the way he's laying in the paint here trying to come to terms with the head and here's here's another one person in a space sitting so he's exploring this space around them and their form. So this the three-dimensional situation. Here's his wife, Annette. So it's not so much that he's trying to depict his wife and her, her body 
as much as he's trying to figure out what's he looking at? What's going on here? Let's look at um, screen sharing has stopped as the window is closed. Okay, so let's go to this speaker view. And I'm speaking. There we go. Um, I'm going to do another screen share of an, of some some more work by him, and I'll speak to it more more directly. Let's see here. Okay. Uh, okay, this one. All right. So this these are. These are some uh, images from uh, the retrospective. I guess it was about almost two years ago at the Guggenheim. Uh, Gu uh, Giacometti had a, a large retrospective in New York City. I had the good fortune to go there. This was one of the opening images of his wife, Annette. And here we can let's see if I can get that over there. Nope, doesn't really work like that. Uh, okay. Let me get, I've got another pic of this that's better. Let's see, there we go. So when, when we're looking here at all these, these marks, we can really see that Giacometti is, he's exploring her facial structure, her head, her cheek, her eye socket, all these things, like a sculptor would. These marks are sculptural marks. And when I say that he's exploring, I mean, he's not trying to depict her the way we would think of in, um, in a normal painting. He's, all his marks are questions. He's um, trying to understand what he's looking at. He's trying to um, come to terms with this person, the situation that's in front of him. He is investigating the form, the mass, the space, and trying to get, get to it somehow. Here's a sculpture, and you can, you can see all this space around it. And one of the things that really doesn't come across in, in, in photos is how these sculptures function in a room um you know we get the we get the weird distortion and the you know kind of this existential kind of lean human being thing but how they function energetically doesn't really come across these things charge the space around them uh you 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 can feel when you get close to them how the space is activated around them. It's, 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 it's uncanny. So they're not still, even though of course they are still metal sculptures or bronze cast, but the way the, the space is activated comes out of Giacometti's engagement, how, how he's looking for something, how he is um, trying to get to something. 
So this is a this is a very very dark image. There are, there were quite a number, and it's hard for me to see here in this room because it's flooded with light. I'm going to put my hat on so I can see it. And I've got a close up here. And I, this is from like the late '50s. I don't know if you can see in there. Um, he's he's looking at uh, a head. I, it, it might be his brother, and it's anything but legible it's it, it's just murky and he's just going and i was blown away by these pieces because it was clear that he he was just unconcerned with legibility and the power of these images was phenomenal because they were so charged with his his looking and his questioning Where'd I go? That's the detail of that one. There's another head. That's the detail. And again, you can see just how he's going and going and going and going and looking and looking. There's another painting. And this one is, is, is lighter and clearer. Man sitting in the studio. So all of this is, is grappling. He's, he's, he's looking and trying to come to terms with This person sitting in front of him. So the, you know, to some extent he's working with value. Things are lighter, things are a bit darker. But really he's laying things down and just trying to get the lines to show up as he's trying to deal with where's the head, what's the structure of the head, chest, person sitting in space, the legs getting close to, closer to him. Here's some still life paintings. And, you know, it's just a few apples, glass of water. It's muddy. Uh, and so that, you know, in, in a way, he's really coming out of what we were talking about um, last week with Cezanne. That is, he's engaging through his perception with this world in front of him. And the painting is somehow a record of that engagement. The painting is um, his, a, a kind of a tracing or an accumulation or an accretion of his questioning, what is this? And what am I looking at? And what is this in front of me? And, and so um, he's, he's not trying to come up with a tonal rendition. He's not trying to come up with any kind of normative um, reading of it. It's a record of his grappling with his experience in front of him through his perception, this world that he is in. So he's, you can see the way he's working like a like a sculptor, and yeah, this is lighter and this is darker. Okay, he can, right, and a little greener, a little yellower, and there's some red and all that. But all that just gets kind of like swallowed up by uh, the the need or the, the 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 grappling of of trying to deal with this stuff in front of him. There's another couple of apples.
They're little paintings, of course. Another one of some apples on a plate. So that it becomes, you know, the, the coming to terms with is the content, right? Through perception, dealing with, investigating, questioning, that's the, that's the painting. Here's a, a landscape. Get a nice detail. So he's throwing down some tone. And then you can just see how he's, you know, the, the boughs of the tree and the, of the trees and the, the roof of this cabin. And I think he's in Stampa. Stampa was the village he was from in, in Switzerland. And, um, you know, it's, it's like as if the, the washes of, of paint that he puts down uh, allow him to start uh, uh, going and come, you know, like, oh, this, the, the form is this way and it's that way. And so he's just trying to figure out some formal um, ways of uh, grappling, wrestling with his experience of his perception. Another one, another landscape. Again, same, this is that cabin and here here we're looking through he hasn't put the the um you know the leaves on maybe it's different season uh here is a i believe this is caroline she was a prostitute he had a long-term relationship with and the close-up photos i have really don't do justice to her head this might actually be better seeing her let's see if we can do that again let's see and this was i believe is a uh, a young woman who he came across and he was interested in painting her and um if i got this right um he asked her father if that would be okay. Uh, he said three or four sittings and it ended up being about 40, if I, if I remember correctly. Here's a detail. And again, he's this, you know, uh, Dealing with it like a sculptor. Maybe I'll go back to, let's go out of this. And let's, nope, that's not what I want. I'm gonna go to, um, well, let's see here, okay. Okay, hi. So, I'm gonna see if I can bring that first image back of, um, that we saw from the show, from the Guggenheim um, with his wife. Jordan. Uh, yeah. Was he primarily a reductive or an additive sculptor? Who's asking? Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. Well, I would say he's additive and that he's using line to um, continue to explore, but sometimes he'll wipe as a way of clarifying. Um, but he does seem additive, so he's modeling uh -huh. as opposed to carving. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But in a way, he's, well, so, you know, he, a lot of this work that he's doing and coming to terms with the world in front of him, I mean, he's living, he's in 
occupied Paris during World War II. And he lives through it. And the world is never the same. So you can imagine, you know, I mean, I, you know, he was a fairly anxious person, I think, to, to begin with. And um, so that quote about, you know, working to keep the fear away, um, you know, can make real sense in those terms. Um, but also I would, I would like to uh, look at what he's doing in terms of presence. So let me, let's go to that um, portrait of his wife at the Guggenheim show. I'm going to screen share that again. Is that up? Yeah. Okay. So, um, it's, he's uh, sensing as he is looking at his wife and, and all of these people and the space and the apples and the landscapes. He has a sense of, um, He has a sense of presence of this person, uh, of the situation of the still life, of the landscape. And he is sensing that through his perception. But the presence is sensed, not perceived as such it's invisible in that way so he is using his perception and painting in relation to his perception as a way of getting to this experience of presence this experience of presence that is is the experience of of being, being, simple being. And as he engages through his questioning, through his perception and marking with this experience of being as intimately as he can, the fear falls away. Because when we are in the moment when we are being, when we are aware of our being, there is no fear there. Fear is moving into the future, what may happen, but our experience of being places us right into our now right here. So he's sculpting and he's painting, brings him into his present moment fully. Um, yeah. So, um, let's see, what's that? Um, there's a piece from John Berger that I would like to share with you. Um, I'm going to stop the screen share so you can see me. La 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 la. Hi. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so John Berger, I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with John Berger. He's a wonderful, wonderful writer. He passed away a couple of years ago. And um, this is a book of essays called Keeping a Rendezvous. And uh, I would really recommend virtually everything this guy's written. Um, he was an art critic, he was, but he also was, he wrote 
oh, all kinds of things, fiction, nonfiction, plays, all kinds of stuff. And there is a, um, an essay in here called A Professional Secret. If I can find it. If I can find it. Where he is looking for, um, he was thinking about this painting by Holbein of uh, dead Christ lying, lying out. And um, uh, he thought the Holbein was in Bern. And he, 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 lived, he was living in, uh, in Switzerland also at the time. And so he got on his motorcycle and he rode to Bern. And it turns out that the painting was in Basel. But there he was in Bern in the museum. So he was looking at what they had and they had a number of things. They had a Corbet, they had a Monet, you know, some beautiful painting, a Brock, a love song uh, with a new moon by Paul Clay, a Rothko from 1963. So he's looking through all of this and he, and he writes about it. So I'm, I'm not gonna read the whole, whole thing, but it's, it's quite lovely. And he, but I'll, I'll start. I'll start here on page 128. I found myself before a landscape painted at the beginning of the century by an artist called Carolyn Mueller, Alpine Chalet at Sulvard near Issenfluschel. The problem about painting mountains is always the same. The technique is dwarfed like we all are by the mountain. So the mountain doesn't live. It's just there like a tombstone of a distant gray or white ancestor. The only European exceptions I know are Turner, David Bomberg, and the contemporary Berlin painter, Werner Schmidt. In Carolyn Mueller's rather dull canvas, three small apple trees made me take in my breath they had been seen. Their having been seen could be felt across 80 years. In that little bit of the picture, the pictorial language of the painter was that the painter was using ceased to be just accomplished and became urgent. Any language as taught always has a tendency to close to lose its original signifying power. When this happens, it can go straight to the cultivated mind, but it bypasses the thereness of things and events. Words, words, mere words, no matter from the heart. Without a pictorial language, nobody can render what they see. With one, they may stop seeing, such as the odd dialectic of the practice of painting or drawing appearances since art began. We come to an immense room with 50 canvases by Ferdinand Holdler, a gigantic life's work. Yet in only one of the paintings had he forgotten his accomplishment and could we forget that we were looking at virtuoso pigment. It was a relatively small picture and it showed the painter's friend, Augustine Dupin dying in her bed. Augustine was seen. The language in being used had opened. Was the Jew who drowned in the Rhine seen in this sense by the 25-year-old Holbein? And what might this being seen mean? I returned to look at the paintings I'd studied earlier. In the Corbet of the Three Fish, hanging, gaffed from a branch. Strange light permeates their plumpness and their wet skins. It has nothing to do with glistening. It is not on the surface, but comes through it. A similar, but not identical light, it's more granular, is also transmitted through the pebbles on the river's edge. This light energy is the true subject of the painting. In the Monet, the ice on the river is beginning to break up between the jagged, opaque pieces of ice. 
there is water. In this water, but not, of course, on the ice, Monet could see the still reflections of the poplars on the far bank. And these reflections glimpsed behind the ice are the heart of the painting. In the brock of Lestac, the cubes and triangles of the houses and the V-forms of the trees are not imposed upon what his eye saw, as happens later with mannerists of cubism, but somehow drawn from it, brought forward from behind, salvaged from where the appearances had begun to come into being and had not yet achieved their full particularity. In the Rothko, the same movement is even clearer. His life's ambition was to reduce the substance of the apparent to a pellicle thinness, a glow with what lay behind. Behind the gray rectangle lies mother of pearl. Behind the narrow brown one, the iodine of the sea, both oceanic. Rothko was a consciously religious painter, yet Courbet was not. If one thinks of appearances as a frontier, one might say that painters search for messages which cross the frontier, messages which come from the back of the visible. And this, not because all, all painters are platonists, but because they look so hard. Image making begins with interrogating appearances and making marks. Every artist discovers that drawing, when it is an urgent activity, is a two-way process. To draw is not only to measure and put down, it is to receive. When the intensity of looking reaches a certain degree, one becomes aware of an equally intense energy coming towards one. Through the appearance of whatever it is one is scrutinizing. Giacometti's life's work is a demonstration of this. The encounter of these two energies, their dialogue, does not have a form of question and answer. It is a ferocious and inarticulated dialogue. To, <clears throat> to sustain it requires faith. It is like a burrowing in the dark, a burrowing under the apparent. The great images occur when the two tunnels meet and join perfectly. Sometimes when the dialogue is swift, almost instantaneous, it is like something thrown and caught. I offer no explanation for this experience. I simply believe very few artists will deny it. It's a professional secret. The act of painting when its language opens is a response to an energy which is experienced as coming from behind the given set of appearances. He goes on for a little bit more, but I'll stop there. Um, so, you know, we are living in strange days. Um, <laughs> God. And I, I find painting and drawing a relief to bring me into the moment, to be here. Uh, my way is through perception. I guess we all have to do that if we're painting and drawing. Uh, but I mean, I like looking at stuff and drawing and painting, you know, from my perception. But it is the... the sense of being. And this is how I understand Giacometti. The, the present moment that it brings me into, that I find 
so relieving. <laughs> um, you know, uh, so that's what I wanted to offer through this talk and thinking about Giacometti and the times we're in, in search of presence, um, and what it may allow us as we live through this. Um, maybe I'll, we've got some time. I'll, I can open it up to some questions if people have. Um, I think you can unmute. And I will uh, exit, I'll go back into this gallery view. Um, I've got a chat here. Let's see what we got here. Uh, la, 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 la. Any, any, hi. Hi, everybody. So if anyone has any questions, you can, you can chat. Um, or I can, um, I think you can unmute. If you can't, let me know. And I'll figure out something here. Um, are we, is this kind of a free for all? Yeah, free for all. Yeah, for okay. We're yeah, and at the end, I'll wrap up and I'll say a few words, but go for it. Yeah. Okay. I thought it was interesting earlier. I don't know whether it was Stephanie or Jill who had asked whether he was an additive painter or not. Um, I've lost you now, but um, in any event, um, I, you know, you had said, well, he was additive, but I kind of feel that he was both. Okay. Um, additive and reductive because, I mean, because I've been doing monotypes mm -hmm. largely too, but mm -hmm. not, that's not the only reason. Um, when, when he adds white, yes, he's adding it, but he's mm -hmm. basically taking, he's removing the image with the white. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I felt like he did, I, he did both. He was doing a little dance with his mark making as well, where he was adding and subtracting all the while. Mm -hmm. um, I know Graham used to do, a, Graham Nixon used to do a, um, an exercise with students where you painted something and then you painted it out mm -hmm. um, with white marks. Mm -hmm. You painted back into it until you had an entirely white picture. Okay. Right? And it was an interesting um, process. Mm -hmm. It was also very, you know, taught you a great deal. Mm -hmm. but, I, but that's my opinion anyhow, okay. for what it's worth. Yeah, that's oh, fine. Thanks, Lisa. Nice to see you. Nice you to know, see I, you. I think for Giacometti, you know, thinking the way he's he's putting the figures together and he's kind of molding, although he's kind of molding down to like something essential. And right. the same when he's painting. And yeah, he's he's putting down white and kind of like carving to some extent that way okay. as he's trying to find the head. But I have the sense that even there, for Giacometti, space isn't an absence. Space seems to have a fullness that meets form, that everything is full in some way. Yeah, I see and what so you mean. And so the white uh, adds the way the black adds. Everything is, 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 and in a curious way, Even though he's he's marking and kind of adding in that way, and mm -hmm. you can see even like when you look at a real painting, the nose is like a relief sculpture. So it right. starts there, yeah. right? And yet all of the marking, all the paint, all the material seems to be adding up to this invisible. Being that is nothing. It, it's not material. It's like all of the adding up, all the going in, all the making is to get to what's behind and well, that's very interesting. open. It, it does kind of disappear, and I don't yeah. want to take up everybody's time. No, it's okay. It does other... kind of disappear. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of disappears. That's I right. felt like with the black paintings, the very dark paintings that looked yes. almost as though they were yeah. mark making on lead or something. Um, that in They're a canvas way- canvas that were just mounted. Uh, well, they in, look in the really image. They're strange. just scraps, scraps of right. canvas. They were phenomenal. They were right. like garbage, but yeah. amazing. Amazing, right? Yeah. And also like a shroud, yeah. I guess, kind yeah. of, where yeah. the image is emerging. And kind of like, almost as though you're developing a photograph or something. And something like that. That's After right. you look at it for a little while, it starts to surface and come toward you. 
yeah. and go back again. It's just, it's very um, hard to grasp, very mercurial. Yeah. Right? Let, me, let me see what we got. We have some other folks here. I want to just check in. Thank you. Let's mm. see. Um, so we, let's see here. Yeah, that, that uh, right? The port, uh, Giacometti, a portrait by James Lord. It's a great read. Jordan? One can second. You hear me? I just want to look through this for a second. Um, Dave, it seems like when he was painting, he was trying to make the space surrounding his figures into a material. Yes, he could explore. Absolutely. Obviously, the space around a sculpture is not as tangible to the sculptor as the clay or bronze. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Okay. Um, yeah, you, ja was that you, Jacqueline? No, that was me, Leslie. Leslie. I, Hi, Leslie. I can't get my face on the screen, but I jumped in because you were referring to that book, The, the Portrait, or By James Jacqueline Gordon. Paints the Portrait. Okay, I've read that. It's fantastic. Great. What I remember from that is that, you know, he would paint all day, and his sitter thought it was like a masterpiece and then they'd come in the next day and he would scrape the whole thing off and say no that's not it at all <laughs> right and i in the context of the things you've been saying i just wonder what do you think was his standard there did he come in the next day and say uh i didn't get you know behind it enough i didn't get the, you know when i read that book i thought he was saying oh i didn't i just didn't get it right i didn't i think what, what, i, I think don't think that mix. was his standard <laughs> Huh? I think it was a mix. And I think on one level, he was saying exactly that. I didn't get it right. It did. No, it doesn't feel like you. It doesn't look like you. Kind of like, you know, the way we're so critical of our own work. Yeah. But on a deeper, more intuitive level, I think he understood that there wasn't enough presence in the piece that the experience he had of James sitting in front of him was so much more vibrant than what he felt from the painted image, that he had to go further. Yeah. But of okay. course, how could the painting match up to the vivid life force of an actual human being? You know, and so it is sort of this, you know, that's why when he painted the young the young girl instead of three or four sessions it ended up being 40 because it's endless he's asking questions as a way of getting intimate with presence and of course that's endless so it just kept going thank you yeah Anyone else have a, a thought to share or a question or? Did Giacometti ever say anything about why he elongated everything? I, hi, Melissa. I think he actually, he spoke of his actual perception of that. I think it, it changed to some extent as he got older, but apparently he had some experiences where he ended up seeing in a way that fit that. He really did see in this kind of distorted, that he spoke of an actual, of his actual experience being like that. <laughs> kind of wild. Uh, okay. Composition, so Alexis, you're asking about composition? Um, in terms of Giacometti's composition, I, it seems to me that he's setting things up in a very frontal way and then going at it. I mean, with the, with the landscapes, maybe a little less so, but the people, you can see he's, he's facing them and he wants them to face him. And he's, he, because he's trying to get directly at the way presence meets us, ostensibly, apparently us. <laughs> well, it's almost like they're looking off the page or they're, they're part of 
Well, let me let me let me finish it up. There's what what's happening when he's looking at somebody, and they're facing him. We have the presence of the person, his presence of being, meeting the presence of the person. It's presence meeting presence. That is frontal. No matter what, no matter what we look at, when we are open, the world meets us. And if we stay there, the boundary between the world and us, or who we think of as us, dissolves. And there is just presence. And he's trying to meet that. He's trying to be there. And so he's trying to limit and simplify his composition to just get at that as directly as possible. That's, that's my understanding. Um, we have another chat here. Uh, final portrait about Giacometti and his painting process, not a documentary. Yeah, I heard it was good, actually. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. This is Dan, is that you? It is me. Hi. We were talking about the uh, issue of his composition and how actually about. Uh, I can't hear you. Okay. Is this better? Better. Okay. Um, the composition, how it's actually, you know, it's really about relationship. Um, it's not necessarily uh, a dualistic relationship. Right. And that's the, the interesting part is somehow. What we, often, what? what we often depict yeah. is like our, uh, is something like a dualistic or a, a, a projection, maybe. Okay. Uh, but what he's looking for is not subject object. It's about something different. Agreed. How I would phrase it, and this is language that I have uh, been exposed to through listening to Rupert Spira talk about the subject-object relationship. And he talks about the collapse of the subject-object relationship. That when we drop into the experience of being, and we could drop into that in different ways. It could be through love. It can be through our understanding. For us painters, it could happen through perception. And we experience beauty. And beauty, the experience of beauty, is the collapse of the subject-object relationship. We're just all there. And it seems to me that that is what Giacometti is, is engaging with through questions, not answers. He keeps on marking as questions as a way of eliciting, conjuring, trying to drop into that collapse of the subject-object relationship. And I, so that they're the, the way we're looking into each other's eyes. Hey, Jordan. Yes. Yeah. So I, I really appreciate the definition you have, have of presence. Um, I was kind of confused on what that was, but you clarified that really well. What did I say? <laughs> what did it's I say? Now, not the future. Yeah. But now. Now. Right here. Right. Simple presence. It's not a fancy thing. It's what we know when we're just here. Yeah, absolutely. And, and great painting, they hit us, and, now, and then we're now. We're not thinking about anything, and we're like, whoa. Bring us right here. Someone else? Oh, Jordan, I, I was, I've really been thinking about the, one of the first things you said about how he was working on the piece while he was um, being interviewed. And yeah. he said, well, it was to keep the anxiety away. Fear, he said, I mean, the translation, 
the, the subtitle was fear. Yeah. The fear. And I, someone, a friend of mine just brought up the book, The Plague by Camus. And, uh -huh. and Probably written at the same time as this guy is, right. Right, and the whole idea of the, you know, the existential absurd, absurdity of, you know, that, that we're all going to die. And what is, the, and, and that's the, the fear. And I think that's what pulls artists towards that idea of presence. It, it, the, the, that moment, to be in that moment with that intimacy with object subject where they collapse, like you say, there's something there that feels like it buffers you from that fear of, of you know, that, the, the absurdity of. Well, it's interesting that you use the word buffer. In a way, how I understand it is it doesn't buffer me from the fear. It transforms the fear. Yeah. The fear changes. I'm not trying to keep the fear away, actually. By being here, the fear changes. And right. it, it just turns into being here. Uh, yeah. Uh, buffer is the wrong word. Mm -hmm. it's, it's you step into a moment. Yeah. You step into this yeah. eternal moment. Yeah. And, yes. and, and we only step, we step into it and then we step out yeah. and then we step back in and we step out. Yeah. And it's what makes us come back over and over, over again. and over again. That's we our, step. that's right. That is our, that's the gift we've been given as makers. We get to do that. Right. And, and all the years I've looked at Giacometti and seen a lot of his work in person, I get, I get that electric energy coming off of his work yeah. and and it's mixed with this anxiety yeah. <laughs> like yeah, totally well, sometimes if i'm in the wrong frame of mind and i look at it i yeah, just right? i get filled up with anxiety and yeah but it's yeah, yeah. it's it's brilliant yeah. stuff but that mo that stepping in and out of that moment agreed agreed Ooh. the trip of being human oh what happened i don't know um I want to continue. Yes. What happened to that? I don't want to see. Yeah. Where did everyone go? I don't know. Uh, I don't want to end meeting. Maybe it was, I don't understand what happened. Let's see. Where did everybody go? Um, were you still, do you want to continue? Yes. I want to share. I want to see everybody. Can I see everybody? Or isn't this strange? Here we I go. Back, we're back. Nope. And stop sharing. Okay. There we are. Wow, that was weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, we got a few more minutes. Uh, anyone else have? Hi, Jordan. Hey, thank Lonnie. You, thank you for doing this. Oh, thank you too. I don't think I've ever looked at his work before. And what struck me about it was the space uh -huh. sort of inside and how the marks are sort of um, trying to define that space, but there's no definite place where that mark actually goes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, which is how it is. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Very, nice. very electric feeling, like alive. Wonderful. And then the dark ones are sort of different because I don't know, it's like density. It's like the space has become very dense or something. Uh -huh. Yeah. I don't Hello, know. Jordan. Uh, who is saying hi there? It's Pat. Can you hear me? Hi, hi. How are you? I'm fine, thanks. I just wanted to say, in connection yeah. with the last speaker, but one. Yeah. It reminds me of um, something called terror management theory. Which terror is, management theory, yeah. Uh huh. Which is easily Googleable, but it's about it's a theory that says all art, all religion, in fact, most of what we do, is to shield ourselves from the knowledge that we're finite 
<laughs> which I think is possibly quite relevant now. But it's quite an interesting theory. And what the previous speaker, but one, was saying reminded me of that theory, terror management theory. Ernest Becker, thank, I do believe. Thank you very much. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess we'll we'll wrap up. Um, thank you all for joining me for coming together. It's it really makes a difference for me in this time we're in to have a sense of community, even though we're all in the middle of social <laughs> distancing and trying to figure out how this all works as we go through this. Um, and thank you for those of you that have have uh, uh, put in some donations. I very much appreciate it. Um, we'll be taking donations going in and I'll be uh, doing this again next week. So if you would like to contribute, that would be fabulous. And I'll be sending something out. Next week, I'd like to look at Milton Resnick and um, how I understand his project and his work. Um, if those, uh, if if you're not familiar with Resnick, uh, go ahead and 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 Google him and look at the images. They don't quite. I mean, in some ways they make even less sense uh, online than a Giacometti. Um, so I'll send something out about Resnick. Um, let's see what else. Um, Oh, I've got some online courses coming up. If any of you are interested, you could go to my website, jordanmolson.com. Um, painting Live is tomorrow. Anyway, keep drawing, keep painting, draw. It's easy. Got a piece of paper, you got a pen, just gets us here, gets us right here. And um, I hope you're all well, staying healthy staying in contact uh, with the people in your life and your loved ones. Um, okay. Uh, I will, this is recorded. I will uh, 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 post it and send something out. So if uh, you want to share it, please do. And um, we'll be in touch. Take care. Thank you, Bye. Jordan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jordan. You're very all welcome. Thank you, Jordan. Bye. Bye.